uh, with Gail and Charlie Rose and Nora O'Donnell. They also covered the promotion of the Leonardo da Vinci book. Let's see what they have to say. Best-selling author Walter Isaacson has written biographies of people with great minds like Albert Einstein, Benjamin Franklin, and Steve Jobs. Isaacson is here with his new book. It's called Leonardo da Vinci, as you know by now. It's published by Simon & Schuster, which, by the way, is a division of CBS. Walter Isaacson, welcome. Hey, Gail. Boy, it is so great. Welcome. It's so great to see the history of Leonardo da Vinci that crosses all genres. But let's talk about Leonardo, because you describe him as a man of eye-catching beauty. Mm -hmm. I like that phrase. Of course you do with your old thirsty ass. Um, Yeah, let's talk about Leonardo. Uh, You know, polymath. Uh, rampant homosexual and pedophile, massive degenerate, worshiper of the Bacchus. You know, that's Leonardo da Vinci in a nutshell. Flowing golden cur- curls, muscular build, uh, good physical strength, and a genius, but a different kind of genius, you say. It's all up uh, Vitruvian man. Yeah, a wonderful funny. drawing. I think you have so it that there. Was his and I think that's a self-portrait of him. It, it fits his description totally. And it is an icon of connecting art and science. This is a drawing in which... Yes, he was at the vanguard of the humanist period and the scientific method. Okay? Uh, Look, uh, and I cannot stress this enough, the humanist period is what the abolition... to to the Caucasian in Europe is what the the abolitionist period is to the so-called black man in, in the early 1800s here in America. Okay? The humanist period is what got them out of their deep, dark slavery. Because what the humanist period did was it it got the black nobility to stop looking at them as just peasants to work on their land. Um, It got them to embrace the quote-unquote scientific method and to disavow a lot of the spiritual aspect of of uh, of their belief system. Now, don't get me wrong, the uh, the so-called black rulership of Europe uh, they were strict adherents to the Catholic Church, which was just a a contorted version of the Babylonian mystery school system. So it, it was fated to not work anyway. But the humanist um, aspect, the humanist philosophical uh, ideologies that arose in the 1300s and 1400s, that was a major factor in the downfall of the black rulership of Europe. ...in which he gets every proportion exactly right. He's been 230 measurements to get it right. But he also does something of unnecessary beauty as he's standing there naked in the earth and in the universe figuring how do we fit in. How is this genius different from other geniuses, though? We well, you know, some people like uh, Mozart say, great genius, but in a particular field. Uh, Mozart was also a so-called black man, by the way, as was Franz Joseph Haydn. Right. And Beethoven. All those men were so-called black. To me, what's interesting is when you can cross fields. He thought of himself as an engineer, a scientist, an anatomist, somebody who loved geology. His notebooks are filled with all of his love of math and science and nature. Uh, Italy. Italy was the uh, the center of the Caucasian rise out of out of servitude. Okay. It was the it was the center of that rise. Italy was viewed as the epicenter for humanism and for, of course, for the Renaissance. You had a Renaissance prior to the Renaissance, was known as the Italian Renaissance. You had something called the Carolingian Renaissance, which occurred during the time of Charlemagne and his progeny. And then like the 800s, 900s A.D., uh, they were the first ones to, you know, start to em- embrace humanism to a degree. But uh it, like I stated before, it wasn't until a lot of these other factors that emerged in the 1300s, that being the so-called Black Plague, the Hundred Years' War, uh, the Surf Rebellions, things of that nature, that really gave the Caucasian the impetus that was necessary for them to rise out of that, you know, of that deep, dark hole that they were in, all right, which started all the way back from the latter part of the Roman Empire uh, to that time. But also art. And so I think... Real creativity comes when you can see the cross currents of nature as opposed to getting all siloed. He was an expert in so many things, and yet he had no formal education. Well, most of your great geniuses um, are self-taught. That's normally how it goes, Miss O'Donnell. The college system is set up to really just uh, initiate the debt system, the the credit-based debt system that... Uh, hangs over the head of most 
uh, so-called educated people here in America. Uh, but if you if you were to read up on most geniuses, most of them are self-taught. I think he was lucky. He was uh, lucky to be born out of wedlock, which meant he couldn't go to the university. So he became what he called, you know, a self-taught person. He and that also, you know, was heavily why he was, uh, uh, he basically was a an atheist. I won't even say an atheist. He was a believer in the hermetic principles, the hermetic philosophies, uh, the veneration of Bacchus. Had he had to, you know, had he been forced to in, in engage in any formal education, he would have been indoctrinated into the Catholic Church belief system. Became a disciple of experiments and experience. And this is the beginning of the scientific method in a way where people say, well, let me test the wisdom I've been given. Oh, before I forget, since he brought up the scientific method, one of the main tricks that Leonardo da Vinci played on people was the Shroud of Turin. For those of you guys who don't know, the Shroud of Turin was a hoax that was uh, perpetrated by Leonardo da Vinci. Supposedly, it was to replace a previous shroud that allegedly depicted the image of Christ for the uh, House of Savoy. Allegedly, this is the backstory that is alleged. But um, Leonardo da Vinci is is the one who those those who are in the know. He perpetrated that that hoax um, by utilizing a a, um, a technique called camera obscura, which is an old ancient technique to use light to uh, embed an image on fabric if you overlay it with, I believe it's silver sulfate. I'm trying to remember which element it is that he, or which compound it is that he overlaid the, on the fabric to make it, to make it uh, get embedded on there. But it's a tactic or a technique called camera obscura, right? C-A-M-E-R-A, just like the word camera, last, and the second word is O as in Oscar, B as in boy, S as in Sam. C as in Charlie, U as an umbrella, R as in Roger, A as an apple. All right. So the the so-called Shroud of Turin does does not depict Christ at all. That is Leonardo da Vinci. Okay. Once again. So he born just as the printing press comes about Gutenberg, and he just reads everything, and he's a person in history who wanted to know the most about everything you could possibly it's know. It's almost the Aristotelian method in some ways, but mm -hmm. you write a. Oh yeah, Aristotle, he was a so-called black man too. Uh, Alexander the Greek was a Caucasian, but Aristotle was black. And I think I mentioned this already. Plato and Socrates, the, those men were all black, believe it or not. Write about his to-do list. Sometimes my husband oh. makes fun of my to-do list. But oh, the thing, <laughs> we can learn from Leonardo. Make I know, I list. love that you say the to-do list. He just wrote about what is this, figure out this. Every Why is the sky about. blue? What does the tongue of a woodpecker look like? Every day we get a list from him of the things he wants to learn. And it's sort of inspiring. And the, and the book is based on the more than 7,000 pages of notebooks. Yeah. What, what, what did we learn? What did you learn? Um, in the course well, of the, the cool research, thing, we didn't know before. Well, the cool thing about the notebooks is that after 500 years, we can still flip through them and see day by day what he was doing. And fortunately, paper was slightly expensive. So on any particular page, he's maybe drawing a sketch. Of we know day by day what he was doing. He was molesting little boys. Sketch of the Last Supper. But then he's doing a little math experiment, and then doing mountains, and then doing the swirls and curls. And so you see how his mind leaps but across. The paper is jam-packed. I love yeah. the Mona Lisa story. I mean, movie. look what you have on screen, man. The what? fetus in the womb is like a Ooh. thing. Yeah. It's very detailed. His drawings are very interesting. That's why I would recommend that, that uh, brothers purchase that book with his sketches in there. Uh, very interesting work. Yeah, but when you talk about the Mona Lisa smile, you said that he used to bring in musicians to make her smile. Right. But what I thought was interesting... I'm glad you believe that dumb shit, Gail. You believe in Santa Claus, too? Interesting is he would go to the morgue and look at cadavers and right. peel back to see the formation of a smile. Right. When you ask, you know, what do you find in the notebook? We have page after page of him d uh, dissecting the human face showing every muscle, every nerve, whether the nerve comes from the brain or the spinal cord. And then, after a few pages of it, the first slight sketch of Mona Lisa's smile. So we Look, this guy, this guy did all this research on Leonardo da Vinci, so he knows everything that I'm saying. He knows that all of these paintings that Leonardo did, the vast majority of them were based off of either himself or his boyfriend, Salai, or, or uh, Cesar Borgia. And with the sole intent of really just trying to deface the um what was recognized as the normal image of the entities of the bible the normal images of the entities of the bible when you go through the holy roman empire and you look at the the real relics they they were always depicted as so-called black men 
All right. Now, you had a man named Thomas Cromwell, who I believe was the grand uncle or somewhere along the line. He was related to Oliver Cromwell, who helped lead the parliamentarians in overthrowing uh, the, the line of King James in the, in the uh, mid 1600s. You had a man named Thomas Cromwell, who was the Lord Privy Seal for Henry VIII. His job was to destroy all the relics in England. At the time, those were the Catholic relics, but they, those were all the relics that depicted the original, um, you know, the original black images, not only of the kings and the queens of, of the British Isles, but also the depictions of the saints. As I stated, they were Catholic, so they were into relic worship. So we see how the science connects to the art, and it's inspiring. Part of it's eerie. Yeah, it is it eerie, but, you know, he just had this passionate curiosity for curiosity's sake. And so he's doing anatomy dissections, but he realizes that the beauty of the human body is connected to the so Where did that drive come from? It, it was just innate for him. Did he just no, it I don't think so. I mean, I think there's certain innate geniuses. Einstein is one of them where, you know, whoa, he got some processing power. But I think with Einstein, I mean, with Leonardo da Vinci, he pushes himself. To just right, but that's also a form of genius to push yourself to actually want to learn. Look, I don't deny that the man was a genius. He was just a degenerate. To just be more curious, as Nora said, you read those lists of things he wants to learn. And so that's why he's a more accessible genius than some of the others I've written about. Because we can do that, too. We can, like, he would just say, why is the sky blue? It would be in his notebook, and he'd do it. You've, been, you've compared him to Steve Jobs. We've been saying yeah. all morning, you're going to tell us why the, the two you see. Well, you know, whenever Steve Jobs would launch a great product, I mean, I see all of his products all over yeah. your table and in my pocket. Yeah. At the end, he would show the intersection of two streets, liberal arts and technology and he'd say if you can stand at the intersection of the humanities and science or arts and engineering that's where creativity occurs to me that's what the trivia man is all about and leonardo da vinci is all about all right walter they're playing the music it's time to wrap it up all right we already know your book is going to sell like hot cakes i might even get it because I, I would like to get some insight uh into a topic like this but anyway brothers uh, point being is uh, you know, they're, they're promoting a lot of this. I just want to use this as a backdrop to you know lay out a little information on the Renaissance and uh, the atmosphere around it. I'll be covering this topic a lot more in depth in future in future videos, Lord willing. But anyway, peace. All right, so now this is the person that I've been mentioning in the video on Leonardo da Vinci named Salai. Uh, this was a young boy who moved in with Leonardo da Vinci when he was 10 years old uh, and an artist apprenticeship or what they call a pupil. But he also was taken as Leonardo da Vinci's uh, boy lover, which was very common during that time, especially in Renaissance Italy. Uh, they would take boy lovers as apprentices and uh, they would make them pupils. And then when they got a certain age, they would cast them to the side and they would bring in a, another young boy. Uh, once again, that is part of the belief in the Bacchus. OK. Remember, Pan is uh, engaging in, in pederasty, which is man-boy love. Anyway, this is Salai. This is the person that I stated uh, stood as the inspiration and the model for most of Leonardo da Vinci's, uh, most of his paintings. Uh, most of his famous paintings that people try to act like they don't know who they were. No, no, that's Salai. You're you playing games. All right. But anyway, this is Salai as John the Baptist. OK, so-called John the Baptist. Uh, look very closely at the face. You can see that's also Mona Lisa. OK, this person is Salai, is Leonardo da Vinci's uh, boy lover. This is the original sketch that Leonardo da Vinci did of Salai that he was going to use to play, that he was going to use as the model for John the Baptist. This is a drawing known as the Angel Incarnate. OK. Because this is how he looked at that boy, Salai, as an angel. Uh, he was, quote unquote, in love with him and in a, quote unquote, relationship. All right. Starting from the age of 10 years old. Now, once again, you can see he has breasts and he has an erect phallus and the right finger is pointing upward. The uh, same way that I mentioned in the drawing for the Last Supper, when Thomas had the finger pointing upward, that is for the Bacchus or as we know, as we know him today, the Baphomet, as above, so below. The worship of the uh, hermetic principles. Okay, let's go back one more time. That is Salai as the uh, as John the Baptist. This is a drawing of Salai. 
uh, that uh, Leonardo da Vinci did in preparation for his John the Baptist painting. Okay, this drawing is known as Angel Incarnate. You can look it up. You see he has the erect phallus there and he has the finger up in the air. Also, in uh, Leonardo da Vinci's sketches, in his sketchbook, he has a drawing of Salai's anus being pursued by penises on, on that have feet running towards his anus. Okay, so that's how they get down. That's how they got down in the Renaissance <laughs> and during the, the in, in the worship of the Bacchus. This is also Salai as the Bacchus itself. This is a painting that you can look up by Leonardo da Vinci called Bacchus. He, he, he uses Salai as the model. Once again, you see the fingers, uh, right finger pointing one way and then the, le the left finger pointing downward as above, so below. Okay, and the legs crossed. All right, he plays the Bacchus, the hermaphroditic god. Remember, Bacchus is a hermaphrodite. This is another painting of Salai, known as the Mona Vanna. You can look it up. M is in Michael, O is in Oscar, N is in Nancy, N is in Nancy, A is in Apple, and then Vanna, V is in Victor, A is in Apple, N is in Nancy, N is in Nancy, A is in Apple. This is depicting him as a as a uh, hermaphrodite, having both male and female parts. Once again, just like the drawing Angel Incarnate that I showed you. Okay, and you look at the face. That is clearly the same person who stood in as the model for the Mona Lisa. There goes the Mona Lisa. Same person. All right? Same person. There goes the, the so-called famous Mona Lisa uh, painting or depiction that they try to act like they don't know who that is. Uh, at one time, I thought it was Leonardo, but, you know, it's very obvious to me after after research that that was his boy lover, Salai. OK, Salai was eventually replaced by another boy named Francesco Melzi, uh, who was with Leonardo until he died in 1519 in the court of Francis I of France. Hey, oh, and by the way, the name Salai means a uh, little devil or unclean one. OK, so that was the person that Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo da Vinci was quote unquote in love with for all those years until he was replaced by another little boy. So this th these are the type of people that they venerate. But the reason why they venerate them is because they were key in pushing and promoting the worship of the Bacchus. All right. Who was also known in other cultures as as Osiris or, you know, as we know him in the scriptures as Nimrod, the son of Cush. But anyway, peace.